let me introduce our, our first speaker. It is uh, David Jones, uh, at, uh, a professor at the Quantum Matter Institute of the University of British uh, Columbia. Uh, he he did, got his first degree from Swarthmore College, uh, then uh, went to MIT, uh, got his doctorate there working with uh, Herman House and uh, uh, Eric, Eric Ippen. Uh, he did postdoctoral work at, uh, at, at Jilla. Uh, I said, oh, you mean you're that Jones? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm not. So if you remember that work with, with the frequency qualms and that. Uh, he has now uh, been at the University of British Columbia uh, and is uh, working both in ultra-fast ultra uh, laser physics uh, and also uh, development of techniques involving frequency qualms. So I'll let you take over. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and again, truly, thank you very much, Paul and, and Bob, for inviting me to, to speak a bit today on our work uh, on <coughs> doing some new techniques of probing uh, solids with um, femtosecond uh, technology based in part on frequency combs. So um, this is a slide that I would give uh, when I talked about the, the evolution of, of frequency combs, describing the, the, the collaboration between the ultrafast community and the ultra-stable community and then producing uh, frequency combs eventually, leading to many different applications, including uh, carry envelope uh, phase stable or sensitive physics, rather. What I'm gonna add uh, to this list is another one that we've uh, since developed, and I'll give you some, some exciting results on uh, photo emission spectroscopy. So uh, with that, just a brief outline, um, I'll introduce uh, you all to photoemission spectroscopy, and in particular, time and angle resolved photoemission spectroscopy. Uh, some previous work that's been done and what the current limitations are. Uh, our approach using um, comb technology plus high harmonic generation, and then our sort of first results and our future uh, roadmap. So this is a, a slide uh, taken um, from, uh, I guess, a textbook from um, Photo Mission. And uh, this is a technique that's been around for, I guess, almost 100 years or even more, um, enhanced, of course, by the development of the laser by um, Towns and, and Shallow. And um, basically what you do is you take a, a, a photon and a photo emit uh, an electron, and it, sort of to first order, you map the density of states of the electron into your, um, uh, into the spectrum of the electron that's emitted. And this allows you for, of course, to study materials um, uh, at the electronic level. So two photon spectros, or two pho photon photo emission uh, adds in the, the time resolved component where you first pump to an unoccupied state. I should mention we're talking about valence bands here now. So you look right below the Fermi level and right above, and you pump to some unoccupied state uh, and then wait a certain time before photo emitting, and you can track sort of um, non-equilibrium or dynamics. Um, and it's been used quite extensively uh, uh, in molecular electronics. Uh, one of the uh, members of the uh, uh, faculty here at University of Ottawa Albert uh, Stolo has certainly done a, a seminal work on vibrational modes using this technique of molecules. Of course, the electrons um, also uh, contain momentum. And so by measuring the momentum, or rather the angle that the, photo, the electrons are emitted, uh, you can actually start to study the band structure of, of solids now. So we're going from gas phase to solids. And in order to do that, you use um, a commercial, now commercial product that uses electrostatic lenses to map the uh, angle down to a specific um, dimension in the detector plane, and therefore um, un extract the angle and therefore the momentum of that electron. Of course, this, um, just a, a very quick primer on solid state physics, um, by, by knowing this angle, um, you can start to correct, characterize the energy band dispersion of a material and therefore 
know what's going, or have a better idea of what's going on uh, inside the material because you know uh, what the electron behavior is. This is pretty critical in terms of determining new materials because um, any, uh, it, it turns out that the electrons right near the Fermi surface determine uh, many sort of interesting properties that we could use um, and leverage for new, um, new materials such as uh, conductivity, superconductivity, or um, as well as topological uh, states that are now being developed by, by even uh, newer materials. So how do you fold um, time into this? Well, you can do the same thing, and this is a, a beautiful figure I borrowed um, from the um, Max Planck group um, in Berlin, or Friends Harbor Institute, where um, you pump, again, uh, an electron below the Fermi level to um, an, <coughs> an unoccupied state and watch it evolve in time. So what I'm plotting here, or what they're plotting here, is energy versus um, uh, K parallel, or the in-plane momentum of the electron. Uh, it's pumped up. It evolves over time. Uh, in dynamics with the band structure before you then photo emitting and analyzing it. And again, as a function of changing the delay between the two, you can see uh, what this dynamical response is. So um, what is shown here, um, I've shown, or I've mentioned before that um, uh, we need to concentrate around the, the electron, or around the Fermi energy rather. And in this particular diagram, the Fermi energy is in the second Brillouin zone. And so when we, uh, of course, it, de it varies depending on the material uh, where this particular um, aspect is, and, or this uh, quantity is, rather. And so um, what, how do we access that? Well, first of all, we should take uh, maybe a couple steps back and, uh, and understand um, how we actually analyze both the energy of the electron coming out and, and the momentum. So what I've shown here is a pump probe sequence onto a sample. The electron gets emitted, and we're going to measure um, these three quantities, the, the kinetic energy and the angle of emission, um, the polar and azimuthal angle. So what's shown in blue here are the measured quantities, and in red are uh, the derived quantities of the sample that we're actually looking at. So um, this gives you the energy of the bound electron. This is the photon energy you start with uh, and the work function of the material in the analyzer uh, that you need to take into account. And then the momentum that you can span um, is determined uniquely by uh, the kinetic energy which again then depends upon your photon energy, as well as the angle here, and that sort of is more of a technical issue regarding um, your uh, sample holder and its ability to move. So what I'm plotting here now is photon energy, how, what energy that we're exciting at, versus the momentum that we can access. It turns out that many materials of interest can't be fully investigated because we can't access the full Brillouin zone and get to the Fermi energy. So uh, graphene is, is fairly well known, it's, it's uh, as many of you mo know, um, and to truly understand what's going on in the, in the non-equilibrium case, we need to access this energy, which um, requires around 20, 25 EV photons, uh, perhaps. There's some other uh, materials here, quantum materials that are also listed. These are transmission, transition metal uh, dichalcogenates. This is a new uh, set of materials that are quite interesting, uh, as well as some superconductors that still haven't uh, been understood. So I guess the takeaway from this slide is we need a high photon energy to order, in order to understand um, the, the band structure, non or the non-equilibrium dynamics of the band structure. This is not, of course, everything. Um, you also need to have a detectable signal rate. And so um, when you have a pump probe sequence onto your analyzer, um, these are the quantities that are directly under your control that um, relate to the signal rate. 
First is the area, um, and this is sort of limited by the domain size or the sample size that you have here. Um, so that's sort of not actually under your control. Um, the fluence of the pump. Well, in the fluence of the pump, you need to reduce it enough to avoid space charge. And what this means is that if you excite, if you excite several electrons per pulse, those, pu those electrons will interact with one another and actually distort uh, what you're measuring, particularly by energy broadening. Uh, so that's something that um, is actually going in the wrong direction because we want to go down. And then you have the fluence of the pump. And if you have too high a fluence of the pump, you can permanently alter the sample that you're trying to study because this is a, this is a, a measurement that, uh, take, as you'll see, takes several hours to make um, uh, in some cases. And so this, uh, to put a number on it, this is typically microjoule to, to millijoule pulse energies. So we're left here with the rep rate. And practically, this needs to be about a kilohertz or more. Um, so this means, unfortunately, no synchrotrons or FELs. You also have sort of timing issues uh, slaving the, the pump laser to your uh, pulses from your uh, synchrotron or, or free electron laser, as well as some other issues. So um, this kind of pushes you toward using um, high harmonic generation. Um, and this, of course, I should, uh, this has become such a common theme that I haven't labeled it, but of course it's, it's due to Paul Corcoran, this uh, explanation of how high harmonic generation works um, back in the 80s, I believe. And um, uh, using this technique, you focus a, a laser pulse into a gas jet and you generate um, XUV photons or VUV even, or XUV and even soft X-ray that we might hear about later today. Um, and um, what I've listed here are just some notable results. They're certainly not inclusive, but just some notable results using XUV generation through high harmonic as a source for time-resolved, angle-resolved photo emission. And you can see the rep rates, the um, energy, the photon energy, um, time resolution, as well as the uh, energy resolution. And the energy, energy resolution, of course, is related to the time resolution through the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, I will speak more about this in a minute. What I would like to highlight, though, is some of the most um, exciting results have come out of a beamline uh, in the Rutherford lab uh, just outside of Oxford, where they actually have a built-in uh, angle resolve photoemission spectroscopy uh, beamline end station uh, with these sort of characteristics. Um, these are recent results that have uh, been coming out, just again, a, a selection. Um, and this is probably the, the most successful uh, time-resolved work. You can see it's about a kilohertz or so. So again, this is on the order of several hours of, of measurement. And one thing that, that I would like to highlight is because of their uh, 30 femtosecond pulse width, they have a fairly poor energy resolution. And um, of course, you want to see the time dynamics, but some of the time dynamics are slow enough that you'd like to shrink the energy resolution and therefore uh, get some detail about the band structure. So just to highlight um, all of these uh, examples, or, or all of these sort of parameters that you're trying to uh, optimize, um, We've definitely got the, the high photon energy to sample more momentum space, but you also have these effects that you need to worry about, as well as the balance between time and energy um, resolution. And so <coughs> what we've done is um, taking frequency sort of comb technology and um, improved the rep rate as well as this balance between the two. And this, uh, what we've done is, Instead of using high intensity uh, amplified low repetition rate pulses, we've used a cavity, a passive enhancement cavity here, and coupled in uh, a high rep rate seed that coherently gets um, amplified in the cavity, uh, comes out. And because of the, the high average power in here, it's up to around 10 kilowatts of average power. I'll go over the specs in a second. Um, we're able to generate high harmonics uh, with a relatively large pulse width. Um, around uh, 100 femtoseconds or so. And this gives us 
uh, very good energy resolution and still gives us the time resolution we need. So how does this te technique work? Well, this is really the only um, frequency comb aspect of the talk today. And basically, uh, what you're doing in the frequency domain is matching the comb elements of your mode lock laser with the cavity. In the time domain, it's perhaps a bit more clear. You have a pulse running around the cavity, and you control both the envelope of the, of the pulse coming in with that of uh, the one rattling around the cavity, overlap them, as well as control the field uh, the phase of the field underneath, and it coherently adds <laughs> and generates uh, a higher power. So this is what we're looking at as far as specs. I'm not going to go through all of it, uh, except to say that we have about 150 microjoules of pulse energy in here when it's locked, uh, around 10 kilowatts of average power. Um, this is a five meter cavity. Our repetition rate is 60 megahertz, and so. Um, in order to maintain this phased coherence, uh, we need to actively stabilize this five meter cavity to around, um, I've listed two nanometers, even probably a bit smaller, um, over the, the time frame that we're measuring this, which is around, um, well, at least uh, 24 hours or even longer. The, the care envelope phase offset, which is the, the phase of the, of the pulse underneath, actually drifts fairly slowly, um, but we still stabilize that as well. So these are some um, long-term measurements of our performance uh, of the harmonics coming out. I should mention, we're out the, the harmonics are generated collinearly here, and we have a grating mirror inside here which diffracts it out to, to provide both the output coupling as well as the spectral selection. I, I'll mention here some disadvantage of this in a second, um, but this is what we've, we've done so far. Um, this is the normalized, uh, Amplitude variation, I, I just want to point out the, the x-axis here is hours. So 15 hours, we have about 5% uh, of the harmonic variation. Uh, this is just a, a plot of the slow PZT that's um, soaking up basically the heat dumped through the mirrors to the breadboard, and it's expanding, and so the, the slow PZT is, is taking that. We also have a fast PZT to take um, account of any sort of um, fast variations. <laughs> this is um, just uh, uh, showing the harmonics that we can get with Krypton and Argon. Uh, we typically are running with Krypton, but we probably will move to Argon in, in, in a, well, for our runs um, later this year. So this is the setup, and I'm going to go through a couple um, commissioning measurements to sort of show you what we've achieved. Um, this is the hemispherical analyzer here. Um, and we generate the, cat, the pump, uh, the XUV here, and then we have an IR pump. Um, nearly collinearly uh, joined here, um, and then the sample is right in here. For measuring the, um, the energy resolution, um, well, first, before the measurement of the energy resolution, what we had to do was image this, this um, XUV. Uh, this distance is around two meters to the cavity, and so we, we also had to go through a differential pumping stage. This is around one millitor, and this is uh, 10 to the minus 11 uh, tor. And so you had to th we had to thread this XUV beam through this differential pumping stage um, and also get a nice spot size. So this is the spot size on the sample. It's uh, uh, 200 micron by 400 micron. We're limited in this dimension, actually, by the angular dispersion of the grating. Um, which I mentioned earlier. And this is a disadvantage, certainly, of the, um, the grading. Um, and we're, we're um, improving on that by going to a different output coupling scheme uh, currently. However, um, this gives us some advantages because we can actually filter right here and improve our energy resolution, as I'll show you in a second. It does implement some pulse shear. Um, on the XUV beam, and we actually can measure that. If, if anyone has any questions, I, I have some, uh, some uh, results on that later. But first, um, measuring the energy resolution, uh, we uh, deposit gold here and look at, uh, and keep it at four Kelvin. Look at the photo emission. These are the valence bands. Um, and then here's the Fermi edge right here of gold. And what we do in order to measure the energy resolution is, is zoom in here 
and fit the Fermi edge convolved with a, um, an energy width which represents the, the um, pulse in order to determine the energy resolution. So this is a zoom in here. Of course, if, um, if, if the gold was at zero, it would be almost a step function. Here it's smeared out a little bit due to the, uh, the temperature as well as the finite uh, energy width of the, of the pulse. And so we get around 30 MeV um, directly. And then when we filter it, as I measured, as I mentioned, because of the angular dispersion, uh, we get down to 22 MeV, which is certainly enough for, um, well, it's three times better than anything's been, uh, any other source that's been uh, developed so far. And it gives us uh, access to sort of very uh, detailed, um, how do I want to say it? Um, uh, being able to, to see the energy uh, dynamics um, with, with a high enough resolution. So to measure the timing resolution, what we ended up doing is, is using graphite. So this is the crystalline structure of graphite. Uh, if you just take a single layer, of course, it's graphene. Uh, if you project this down onto a 2D reciprocal lattice, um, this is the unit cell. Uh, gamma is the center, uh, and then one corner is a K and K prime. M is, is in the middle of that. And um, if you had a 6 EV laser, which is a quadrupled tie sapphire, you are nowhere near the first brilliant zone. You're just spanning this energy range. With our system, we can cover an entire uh, brilliant zone even a bit further, and therefore, for the first time, we're able to time, do time-resolved measurements right at the K point. And the K point's interesting uh, in graphite or graphene because it has a Dirac cone. So this is the band structure um, right at the K point, and it's nice and linear. Um, what this means is that it's an ideal thing for us to characterize our laser system because when we pump uh, with 1.2 EV, we um, get localized electrons here that we can actually zoom in and measure and actually perform, as you'll see in a second, a cross correlation of the IR pump and, IR pr and the XUV probe, um, almost in real time. First though, um, <laughs> if you do a cut around this energy range, or this momentum range rather, I'm just showing here before the pump arrives, this is basically the, below, the lower half of the Fermi, um, or the Dirac cone. Once the pump arrives, we've started to pump electrons up and they get decayed down. There's a lot of electrons here because they're choked right at the Dirac point. Uh, and then as the electrons move away, as the, as the delay uh, increases substantially, they're still there and that's because of that choking. If we look at a different um, region in K-space, the K, um, at the K point, um, you only get one side, this is due to, so we're only imaging this uh, part of the cone. This is due to selection rules based on the polarization that we're using. Nevertheless, um, if you integrate this particular signal uh, in time, or sorry, in K, and then look as a function of delay, you can really, you can, I don't know how many of you can, you can actually pick out the, 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 the time response here and then you have a t sort of long um, thermal response sort of at the end. So if you <coughs> do a slice along here, um, you can see at 0.6 EV, which is half of your pump energy, it's mirrored around the, the Fermi level, you'll see a direct population here, and this is effectively our cross-correlation signal that we're accessing. Um, there's also something here that I'll speak about if I have time in a second. So what we do is you sort of take this uh, green box and integrate um, it to produce uh, the cross-correlation signal. And this is the, um, the result. Uh, this is a, cross a direct cro cross-correlation of the um, IR pump and the XUV probe. It's around 200 femtoseconds. The, uh, the IR pump is um, 120 femtoseconds, so this means the XUV is around 170 femtoseconds or so. As I mentioned, um, there's also something going on here. And I should point out, we can see this because we have very good um, 
energy resolutions. If we had poor energy resolution, this would be, be smeared out. We might not even see the direct population. If you take out the sort of thermal um, uh, electrons, so this is the thermal background, if you take out the, uh, with a two exponential decay uh, model, then this is, again, the direct population, and we have something sitting here. It turns out um, that if you look at it and um, think about phonon scattering uh, and produce a model for non-thermal electrons in there and include sort of two, um, two phonons, which I'll describe in a second, uh, with a mo when you have a model, when you include the model, you get something like this, which matches up fairly well, except for the fact that the model has some higher resolution there. I'll speak about that in a second. But what's happening is um, there's a phonon scattering here from a, an optical K phonon here, and then a gamma photon um, at the lower energy. And we know this from uh, band calculations that um, have been done on graphene previously. So uh, what about this poor resolution? Well, this poor resolution, or this, um, not poor resolution rather, but the fact that the model shows a sharper thing. This model is without, as mentioned, without the spectral broadening that happens in the photo emission process itself. When you include that and then plot it as a function of time delay, it matches up quite well with our results. So we're fairly confident that this is actually a, really a first measurement of the phonon scattering in graphite. Um, again, graphite's not a spectacular material. Graphene would be more interesting, but it's a very good um, sort of demonstration of the source before we uh, move on to other uh, exciting new materials. I should just mention at the end, um, if you sort of uh, integrate the, the signal here and integrate the signal here, if it was in fact phonon scattering, you should see a delay between the direct pumping before it scatters to here. And uh, based on our signal to noise, it's not great, particularly because of our time resolution. But um, we definitely see a, a, statistic, a statistical uh, difference between the rise of the uh, phonon modes and the direct population. So there's a delay between the direct and the phonon modes, which indicates definitely um, there is some scattering time going on in there. So where are we going to go from here? Well, as I've already mentioned, um, we're going to start to, uh, or we are in the process right now of studying other materials, um, exciting new materials that haven't been able to been studied before uh, with this source. And uh, one thing that, that we're moving into is actually using AMO techniques that the community has known quite well um, into solids. So in other words, uh, you can start to do 2D uh, coherent spectroscopy by uh, preparing the system, having a coherent pulse uh, hitting it a second time later, and then probing it with the XED pulse that's coherent with these two. And by varying the delay between the two, you can start to understand the coherence of the solids. Um, as well as perhaps you could actually create quantum states via this optical control. So uh, one state is to, one possibility is to create what are called Okay, block states where in this in this case what you're doing is is you're you're regularly perturbing the system with a with a, uh, an optical pump that mimics uh, periodic block states and uh, these are some candidates of the materials we're going to be using as well you can do phonon or photon dress states and um, do um, uh, use these to create uh, stark stark shifted states and and think about using them for for, for control. So just to acknowledge uh, the work, um, the main sort of emphasis, or the, the main reason why all of these results are here is, is from Art Mills. Um, here's some other postdocs that have been working uh, on this with us, Sergey and Fabio. Um, a, a new grad student, um, Katie, uh, amazing, um, actually did the model, uh, even though she's been there with us for under a year. Uh, and Michael is the, one of the technicians that's helped us substantially, as well as the funding, particularly by the Moore Foundation um, and the, this is CFRF programming. Of course, there's other people here, some other postdocs, and um, I should definitely mention my collaborator, Andrea Domicelli, who is providing support on the, 
the photo emission side, which I'm certainly not an expert on. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, finish and thank you for your attention. So David, um, you mentioned that you have energy and angle resolved information. Um, I think you showed mostly what you learned from the energy resolved spectra. What, what do you learn from the angle resolved spectra? So yes, um, uh, I didn't show a lot of um, angle resolved spectrum because that's more um, studying um, band structure and Fermi surfaces. The reason I haven't st I've shown that is that right, although we've we've certainly measured these new materials, um, we've only measured them statically, and that is because of the um, uh, we're develop in order to pump them, we need to have the right wavelength, and um, for that, we're going to uh, incorporate a mid IR and fire IR source to do the proper pumping. So that's why they're not there yet. Probably time for one more question. Uh, Gerd Lloyds. Would it be interesting to measure uh, the skin or the color? Um, great question, yes. So there are, uh, so in order to measure spin, you of course need to, to separate the spins, which um, uh, we are working on an analyzer to do that. You also need a, um, uh, a circularly polarized source. And to do that from high harmonic, there's certainly schemes to do that. They're not compatible with the cavity approach um, because you need uh, a combination of two linearly polarized XUV probes or there's other uh, uh, aspects or other approaches. Um, we are, however, moving toward um, generating VUV single pass in a hollow core fiber. I think um, this was led by Philip Russell's group at, at MPI. And um, we're working with one of his former postdocs, John Travers, on, with hopefully generating circularly polarized VUV light and therefore being able to start to study the spin on a time. Then you'd have angle, time, and spin resolved photo emission. Yes. Okay, let's thank right. David again.